Jan Ott, welcome back to Stavoren. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Catherine. It's an honor and a pleasure. So two and a half years ago, you educated me about the Erlinda book, and I was fascinated. You came and you spoke at our dinner, and um, we were in Lewarden, and uh, I said, we have to do an interview. <laughs> and one thing led to another, and you said, well, I'm about to publish a whole new English edition. Yes. And you did. And uh, so we started to work on an interview, and then you also published a second English edition in paperback. Because the first one was sold out. Yeah. And I wanted to make it a bit cheaper version. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. And, and there's some more information here. So for the people watching, what is the Erlinda book? Well, most Dutch people will not know either. Yeah. It's really a fringe uh, topic. Um, it was a fringe topic. I think it still is, but... Um, the Solari Report has a way of... Yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody once said to me, if you want to see what's on 60 Minutes, watch the Solari Report six months before. <laughs> well, there may be more people now uh, outside of the Netherlands who know uh -huh. it than, than here. Um, yeah, it's a manuscript, a handwritten text that uh, became known in the 1870s. Uh, we are in Friesland here. Friesland is one of the Dutch provinces. Mm -hmm. And in the Friesian uh, archives, there is this manuscript. Right. And even before the first translation was published, uh, in the newspapers and magazines, there was already a consensus uh, that it was fake and that uh, anyone who would take it seriously uh, was a fool. Right, now Friesland has their own language, the Frisian mm -hmm. language. In fact, we were just up at the Frisian Institute. We have a wonderful picture that we'll use for this commentary of you holding the original manuscript. So, but the original manuscript is in Old Frisian, correct? Yes, uh, the critics would say it's an imitation of Old, Fris old Frisian, uh -huh. but it's much, it most resembles the Old Frisian of the old laws that, that are known. Right. Um, and this is, this would be so old that German, English, Dutch, but also Scandinavian languages descend from it. Right. They will have other ancestors as well. Right. But um, if you know English and German, and maybe one of a, uh, maybe also Dutch and Scandinavian language, it, it is relatively easy to understand. I hear that from from different people. Um, from Switzerland, someone said it. It is like one of the dialects. Really. And um, many of the words. Um, uh, have cognates in all the Northern European languages, yeah, yeah. but there are also words that have only survived in, in particular dialects. So before we dive into the Erlinda book, I want to go through your personal journey in discovering this and becoming now with the Erlinda Foundation, the leading publisher of the Erlinda book and, and clearly one of the experts. So, um, you came from a very different world than ancient manuscripts. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did before you? Um, I had uh, I had just lost a, a good job due to a reorganization. Um, this was for the um, a Dutch trade union of all cinemas and film production companies, film distribution companies. Uh -huh. I first did their statistics and then research, later also logistics, and then there was a uh, Deputy Secretary General, but it got reorganized and I lost my job. I, I uh, had a lot of money and time then, and I didn't want to do similar work mm -hmm. after that. Also, my uh, education at university had been more in the in medical research, mm -hmm. not to become a doctor, but to really do research. Um, so I had a strange curriculum vitae, mm -hmm. and in this time that I uh, when, after I had recovered from the burnout that I had, I, I found this, uh, I found a translation of this book and it resonated really strongly. I was already interested in, mm -hmm. um, in pre-Christian um, mythology mm -hmm. and culture and I had wondered about the, the similarities between the languages, German, English, right. Dutch, Swedish, I knew a little bit. And one thing I had done before I studied at university was uh, study my family history and do uh, mm -hmm. genealogy. 
This was in the 80s, so I really went to the archives. I, I had been used to reading old language, relatively old, and, and doing my own research. But at school I was not good at uh, history or languages at all. I had old Greek, but I was mostly into mathematics. Mm -hmm. And when I discovered this book, and I also read all the discussions about it, I recognized it as really something significant. Because the, the theories about it did not really make sense. There were no good reasons to reject it at, as inauthentic. And even if it would have been, um, even if it would be a 19th century fiction, uh, creation, then it would be still be so significant in the history of literature mm -hmm. for the Netherlands. Because it's a book, uh, 190 pages in the original manuscript, all in this supposedly uh, reconstructed old language, even in a script that's not really mm -hmm. uh, familiar. Some letters are, are recognizable. Yeah, like the W, A, uh, R. There are letters that you can recognize, but also e. some letters that are really different. Yeah. There are three different A's, two different E's, uh, different O's, etc. Uh, there's one letter for NG, mm -hmm. also like the, in the runes. But this would be, this would be such a um, unique piece of work that it would also deserve attention if it would be uh, a forgery. Right. And the way in which um, the people who studied it, who took it seriously, were uh, marginalized or ridiculed, yeah. it was for me a red flag that there is something interesting there. Yeah, if you look at the attacks like that, um, you know, it's very similar to some of the attacks we see today. I mm. mean, this, they've been using these attacks for a long, long time. And um, you see this when they're trying to destroy something that they don't want to endure. You know, it's a real effort to delete something from the public mind. We know that um, in, the, in our history there have been many book burnings. Mm -hmm. And after every uh, war, the victor would decide what the history would become and what, right. what parts would have been erased. It's the same when you study a family history or a right. genealogy, you find that certain stories are ignored or have been changed. Right. So that happens in uh, big history, of course, uh, as well. And when you read these texts, it's easy to um, imagine why the cultural establishment in the 1800s would have uh, not wanted this to become big. So the, the challenges in my experience over the centuries, the secret societies do plant manuscripts. Mm -hmm. They really do. And so, and they have a lot of resources to make them impressive. So you always run into the problem here. Is it planted? It, you know, because it's not just some guy with his imagination coming up with mm -hmm. it. It's a real plant. So is it planted or is it real? And... I think what you're saying, which I think is very important, is it's significant either way. I would think so, yeah. And right. for it being having been planted, there needs to be uh, a motive. What would the purpose uh, have been of the people who planted it? There is one theory uh, that uh, a preacher who was also a poet, mm -hmm. a vicar, a village... Um, Parson. Parson. Yeah, Parson. Yes, that he, uh, that he created the narrative and that a friend of his who was a linguist would have transferred it into this old Frisian and that another, someone who had it, uh, um, who came, who came, uh, who came out with it, that he would have made the script. So uh, a right. conspiracy of these three people, uh -huh. but it's not realistic. I have written a short right. article. It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> No, for different reasons. They would all have lied, and also people around them. Right. Um, even posthumously, they didn't leave anything that points out uh, to this. The linguist would have left because he wrote about etymology. Mm -hmm. It should be possible uh, to recognize his signature. And there have been meticulous studies to try to prove him guilty. Yeah, right. There's no uh, good evidence for it. Right. The, um, the man over the linden, 
yeah, which is Ura Linda it would have been an older version of that name. He was um, a Navy shipyard superintendent. He was a generation older than the other two. In the time that they would have gotten to know each other, they were about to get married, remarried. They had a life. They had to work for a living. They would have had to communicate by mail about this all the time because they lived very far apart. Um, the linguist who would have uh, cooperated, he would have really have risked uh, not only his career but also criminal prosecution because he, at some point he uh, asked the government for, um, for money to purchase the manuscript mm -hmm. and to have it translated. And if it would have come out that he was involved, uh, that would have been a crime. Right. I've written about this. Uh, it's one of the appendages in this version. It's also on my weblog. Right. So this version, in the first, which mm -hmm. is the hardback, uh, but in the paperback, you go into more of the sort of the arguments, pro and con. There are two them. articles, yes. And, and also some other sources that have similar... Uh, that point to similar things. So let's assume that it's authentic for a second. Mm -hmm. The the person who brought it forward, the the pastor. No, that was the the pastor was one of the suspects of the official theory. Right. The Navy shipyard superintendent. He brought it forward. Yeah. Now he had it from his family, or he said he had had it since 1848 as an inheritance, as a family uh, treasure. He had inherited it. Right. And he had tried to uh, read it himself, to translate it. Uh -huh. And when he was older, uh, at some point, he got the idea to ask help at the Frisian Society for Language and History. That was a, a group of people in Leeuwarden um, at high positions, um, notable people. And um, there... The linguist, who was one of who would later become one of the suspects, uh, at first judged it to be authentic and of of significance. Later, he withdrew that uh, position, probably <laughs> that for obvious reasons. A lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, and eventually, one of the older members of the society translated it, and he became convinced that it was authentic. So let's dive in because you can't understand why someone might want to censor this until you understand the contents. Mm -hmm. So tell us what the Erlinda book says. It says that in the 6th century BC, in our common timeline, and there are reasons to doubt that the first millennium was really a thousand years, but in the 6th century before our year zero, uh, texts would have been uh, brought together from the various um, burgs or strongholds that there were. Because, in Friesland. Yeah, Friesland, but also in what is now the Netherlands or even Germany. Okay. So so the Hanseatic area or the Probably North Sea area? Probably not that far. Uh, some cities, it's not clear where it was, but um, mostly in what is now the Netherlands. Okay. And there was a threat of invasion and... Uh, they decided to copy all the texts that were inscribed on the walls of Burgs, mostly. Right. And some of those texts already were very old. The oldest uh, events that are described are uh, a cataclysmic event in which the old land or the Artland, the Artland um, had sub submerged, um, which would have been 2,200 years before our year zero. Mm -hmm. But that's the oldest text. These texts were brought together in the 6th century BC, and then later texts were added by the people who had that manuscript in their possession. Right. And that the youngest of the reports are from about the year zero. And then there are two letters of instruction, one page each, each one from the year 803, and one from the year 1255. So it spans 600 BC to to basically 1200. Yeah, and most narratives are from the time of Alexander the Great, 300 years BC. BC. To zero. And what happened when a lot of people re-migrated back here. Right. And, and much of it is uh, 6th century BC, and also uh, a part which is mainly laws. So I'm 
One of the things, one of the reasons I got very interested when you first said 600, I've been reading about the Zoroastrians, because one Frisian told me that the, um, the king that founded Stavoran had gone to uh, Persia and had studied Zoroastrianism, and that group, when they came back, brought that philosophy, introduced it back. And, um, you know, that there was, because we're talking about a group of people who were phenomenally well-traveled around the globe. Yes, it was a yeah. seafaring uh, nation, and uh, they have founded colonies in the Mediterranean already mm. uh, 1500 years BC, and later on uh, there was a colony in northwest India, in the Indus Valley uh, region. Right. And at some point, many of them also remigrated back. Right. If, if this is true. Spice traders. <laughs> yeah, and it would explain a uh, lot of language similarities also with sans Sanskrit, uh, yeah. the, the Indo-European um, connection. Yeah. Um, yeah, so come back to the question, why would it have been controversial? Uh, these texts, um, one of the main themes is freedom. Yes. And uh, the danger of uh, losing. I would not say... One of them, I would say, the yeah. main theme is freedom yeah. and how you keep it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. In the primal laws, by the folk mother Freya, by the, the personification of their primal mother, who they named Freya, um, there is a set of laws that she would have left. And one of the laws is to um, um, never accept anyone in, in their middle. Who, is, uh, who has sold his own freedom right. or who takes the freedom of another. Right. And the reasoning behind it is um, that um, people with a slave mentality uh, invite people to rule over them. And when people rule over others and they get ever more power, it will corrupt them and um, a lot of misery will be the result of that. Right. There, for me, there is, when I read the Erlinda book, there is so much instruction on how to conduct yourself so that you can be part of a group of people who stay free. So there's a lot of instruction on reminding people what they have to do to remain free and how bad things can get if they even let one bad dog in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's very... Um, you know, for me, it's very good. It's very fun to read it because it's true. Some of the things in our uh, time uh, sound uh, strange. Like uh, one of the pr primal laws is also that if one of the daughters or sons want to marry from with someone from another race, um, it should be it should be um, disadvised. But if they really insist, they are free to go, but they can never re uh, return. Right. Because, they, because then they would they might bring uh, foreign morals right and they were very uh, eager uh, very strict on keeping their morals pure right so in our times of course and since then uh, there has been a lot of mixing anyway but i think they're they're focused not just on genetic mixture they're focused on what happens when you bring one person into the fold who doesn't respect the the integrity of the effort and that can I mean in those days that could get everybody killed mm -hmm. yeah and the latter is much more important right because they speak of the three uh, primal races but from the beginning one of those races intentionally kidnapped daughters right of this group to have their blood but to also um, um, invade it was a sort of uh, right uh, warfare without weapons, without right. Uh, right. really fighting, right. also corrupting the morals, making use of the weak uh, weaknesses of the leaders. Uh, if they were, they could be bought. Right. And uh, there's a lot of covert warfare that is explained in these texts, and uh, much and of this. And there's a lot of sort of uh, good instruction on how to deal with deep state tactics. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's still I, I'm still discovering things that are also relevant for this time, which is also uh, for me um, um, an indication that it may rather be authentic, because so many things did not make sense in the 19th century. Well, you can see why the people who want to centralize control 
do not want this teaching circulating. There's a lot of wisdom in it and right. knowledge and uh, knowledge is power. Um. So one of the things I found fascinating was the attention given to governance structures and, and how to organize and train people to provide leadership and governance. And they have this one uh, practice, which I find absolutely fascinating, which is you take the older women of the sort of tribe and being an older woman, you know, I, I resonate with this, taking the older women in the tribe and preparing them for a governance or leadership position. And one of the things they require them to do to get more experience is they send them down the Rhine to sort of study and learn about other people. Yes, one shore, be, uh, one way, and then the other shore backwards. Right. Yeah, and they were usually, I think uh, they were young women before they would become a folk mother. Uh -huh. There were folk, there were burg mothers. Yeah. And on each burg there were maidens. And one of them might become fo uh, a burg mother later. And there was uh -huh. one folk mother at the main burg of Texel or Texel, Texland. And the, they would not really have power, but they would have influence. They would have all the wisdom mm -hmm. and they could uh, do counselings. Um, they could also be severely punished if they would give, uh, intentionally would give bad counselling. Mm -hmm. They would be banned. And uh, so they did not have, have absolute power. It's not really a matriarchy. Some people think it's like that, but um, I don't think that's really accurate to call it that. Mm -hmm. They were like a bit like the Vestal Virgins later, mm -hmm. which is also described in this book, how they became known later. Right. So uh, I, that one captured me. I'd just been in Sofia three years ago to see Wagner's Ring. And of course, it opens with the Rhine Maidens protecting the, um, the gold. And if you come into my apartment, I've got a, a print of the one artist who did a scene from the from Wagner with the Rhine Maidens protecting the gold. And so I just found the Rhine Maidens suddenly appearing to be a very interesting coincidence. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I must tell you, I have no idea where <laughs> Wagner got the Rhine Maidens. No, so. They're not called Rhine Maidens here. They only made a strip back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a piece about Rhine gold as well, which would have been... Um, they would, they would have found gold in the Rhine back then. Right. Uh, there are many things that, that um, come back in our culture. Right. So I should just mention the Rhine flows through from Switzerland to Germany, and then it splits in the Netherlands into three distributaries, <coughs> one of which flows in the Isomer, which we're, we're right mm -hmm. next to the Isomer here. And um, so the Rhine is very much a part of, and if you look at the trade coming from Switzerland and Germany up the Rhine, it's very, very significant economically here. Yeah, this is also one of the things why, why one can, can imagine why this, uh, there must have been a strong culture here. Right. Because it's a very tactical place to, uh, to have with all the sweet water, the mm -hmm. fertile lands, the oak wood that used to be plenty here. Plus the, the rivers. Yeah, and um, the extraordinary animal protein. <laughs> yeah, and, and so if there would not have been a strong culture here, it would lo long ago have been conquered by right. Mediterranean peoples who supposedly would have a superior culture. And then they would occupy, who would have occupied it here? And we would now be speaking uh, a language that's more similar to one of the Mediterranean. So languages. if you look, the Frisians defeated the Dutch in 1345 at the Battle of Warrens. Mm -hmm. And it took when? Until the 1500s for the Dutch to finally incorporate Friesland into, the, into Holland, I think. For a long time, it was one of the provinces that uh, was one of the United Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not too familiar with that part of history, but um, yeah, West Friesland, which is on the other side of the right. big lake, was conquered earlier in the 13th right. century. Right. Well, that's when the, the Battle of Warrens, in other words, they conquered the Western, but they never conquered the Eastern at that time. No, the Eastern was later. Right. So you could see why in, 15, in, uh, in 1800 they might not want 
the Frisians to adopt this philosophy. <laughs> yeah, for hundreds of years there has been a struggle between uh, the Counts of Holland with the Frisians because they didn't want to pay taxes. Right. Uh, they thought they had a privilege uh, from Charles the, from time of Charlemagne to not mm -hmm. pay taxes. And it was a That's strong... That's right, Charlemagne made a deal with the Frisians. Supposedly. That they, yeah. It's not clear if that's really historical. Really true. But uh, at least there's this tradition. And uh, one of the Frisian um, ideas is also uh, that they would rather be dead than slave. Mm -hmm. It's still very well known. So um, it's very understandable that the, the new kingdom of the Netherlands from the 19th century, that they would not promote Frisian nationality too much. Right. Um, the king of the Netherlands in the 1820s, I think, uh, offered a lot of money to historians back then to write the Dutch history, which would, of course, glorify his family and, and their past, and uh, who would leave out uh, all the parts that were not so favorable to them. Right. And this was only a few decades later that this book became known. So if, they, uh, if the king uh, would have um, then would have known the content, he would have openly forbidden it, but it would probably have worked indirectly. So when I dive into the Erlinda book, I discover something that I, I find again and again and again, which is history is very different than we were taught. Official history is a mess. Right. And there's this meme, uh, if you know how bad our news is, imagine how bad history is. <laughs> that, that's really true. And um, I look at it because I have not been schooled as a historian or as a linguist, uh, perhaps with a fresh look. And um, for people who are really emotionally invested in, in the official history, it will be more difficult to let go of certain ideas. But if you look at this with an open mind, if you really go investigate the, the um, reasoning behind the rejection of this text. I invite, I invite um, scholars and researchers to really argue why this cannot possibly be authentic. Mm -hmm. That's why I've translated it into English, because here in the Netherlands, in the academic world, there seems to be a taboo to even ask that question. Right. Uh, and it's not, uh, of course, it's not only a Dutch uh, matter, this. Because if it's true, the history is so old that it's also the history of the, no, not, o not even only the Western civilization, but also in India and um, right. you know, much more of the world. And again, you can also look at it as a, as a um, literature or as fiction, and then you'll see that's still interesting. Well, to me, if... If, if it is a planted manuscript, it still says a great deal about freedom and how to achieve it. Because yeah. you can't, a people can't be free unless they're willing to conduct themselves in a certain way. And that starts with each person. Mm -hmm. So I used to always have this problem in Washington. You know, the politicians would say, what do we do to fix this? And I say, well, you have to raise the children right. And they yeah. said, that takes too long. <laughs> Well, that's also one of the things that they say here. Yeah. Uh, make sure that your daughters are really good Freya women, because they will pass on the culture and language. Right. They're the most important key in uh, raising a good um, people. Right. Yeah, I remember I grew up in Philadelphia, and my, my father used to always say, the problem with people from Philadelphia is they don't educate the women. He said, in Boston, they send the women to college because they realize you're educating a family. Hmm. <laughs> so. He used to, he used to give the local guys a hard time. Um, I, you know, from what I see, at least in the world that I've traveled and lived in, um, I see my fellow man being taught how to be powerless by being encouraged to adopt the habits that produce slavery mm -hmm. or accept slavery or accommodate slavery. And, and so as a group, they lose the power individually. They, they lose their individual sovereignty by choice or distraction. 
and then they have no potential to fight for their freedom as it comes to be taken away. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen now here, uh, the Netherlands has every year celebrated Freedom Day, the Liberation Day, and there's always been much talk about human rights, but now that it's really relevant to to preserve our freedom or to really talk about it, uh, most people uh, don't even see what's happening. And um, there's this saying uh, by Krishnamurti, I think, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Right. Just to, to create the illusion of freedom. Right. Yeah, you have freedom to choose uh, 10 different types of, um, of uh, peanut butter <laughs> in, the, in the groceries. <laughs> So people talk about freedom, but they don't really realize it when, when it's taken away from them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So talk a little bit to us about the Frisian language, because this is in Old Frisian, or what you said was thought to be Old Frisian. Tell us what the Frisian language is now and how it relates to, to what you translated. Mm -hmm. um, now, I just have to ask you, you spoke Frisian when the when you first found the Orlinda book, or did you have to no, revive I'm a, your Frisian? I'm a West Frisian, yeah. which is not part of the province of Friesland. It's a part of the province of North Holland, right. north of Amsterdam. And we had the a sort of dialect, but it was already much uh, more um, diluted, and it is not promoted like here. Mm -hmm. uh, we were taught to speak um, civilized Dutch at school. Right. And um, so I know a bit of the West Frisian dialect, but it's not the same as the Frisian language. It's a bit similar. Um, and uh, the, the name Holland also all, only came into existence in the year 1000, around the year 1000. Before yeah. that, it was all Frisia. On old maps, you can see Frisia was from, from Belgium. And it's still in Germany, there's a part called Eastern Frisia, mm -hmm. Oost Friesland. Even part of Denmark is North Friesland. Mm -hmm. So it was the whole coastline from Denmark to Belgium. So Dutch would also be a descendant from Old Frisian, from this language. It would also have other influences from right. Frankish, Frankish. Um, and modern Frisian, there are actually many varieties of the Frisian language, right. the spoken uh, varieties. Uh, there is one one a common standardized Frisian, which they teach in courses. And the uh, written Frisian, I think, is a, is a bit uh, artificial. It's more an instruction of how it should be pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the words wind and land, they're the same in Dutch, English, German, all with an D at the end. Only in Friesland they, uh, the they write Wien and Laan mm -hmm. <laughs> without a D. So it's, it's. I think Frisian is an absolutely beautiful it's language. It's beautiful. I love Frisian. Yeah. What I said is not to, to denigrate it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's my idea. Uh, like Welsh um, is written very differently from what is uh, pronounced, mm -hmm. the Celtic languages. And there's a lot of subsidies here. For, for language projects to, to keep it like this. And that's part of the reason why they want to be as separate from, from Dutch as possible. Right. It's an ident it has become an identity thing in which they, if they can choose between a perfectly Frisian Dutch, a word that is similar to Dutch and a less well-known word that's typically Frisian, they will choose the Frisian word. So it's very interesting. I spent about 10 years driving around America talking to all my elders, the oldest people in my family. And I sort of spent 10 years talking to all of them, and then they all died. Mm -hmm. And it was as though the memories were all lost. And one of the things I learned, I learned a tremendous amount of history about my family. But one of the things I learned was the generations kept being tricked. Because they never did a lessons learned on who tricked them and how they got tricked. And then it gets lost, and then they get tricked again, and then they get tricked mm. again. And I said, you know, we need to start learning our history. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, that's how I also started with the family history. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because you find out things that were uh, not told or that were um, changed. Mm -hmm. And by understanding your roots, you understand yourself better. Yeah. yeah and and um, I've learned much from the theories of uh, Rupert Sheldrake with mm -hmm. resonance. 
So a lot of it is in our subconscious. Yeah. And when you can make it conscious, you can uh, more uh, consciously um, make decisions. Did I ever tell you about my fascination with the Rhine? With the Rhine? Yeah. No. So there's this wonderful documentary we've used several times in the Sully Report. You know, we have a Let's Go to the Movies every week. And it's on water. And I love it. It's fascinating. I find water fat. If I had to do it all over again, I would seriously study water in college. Anyway, so it tells the story in the 1600s of a German farmer who had been adopted at a very young age. He has amnesia about his origins. And so he sort of goes on a walkabout to find his origins. And he gets near Lake Constance. Where, you know, the Rhine comes into Lake Constance and then goes out. And, and um, you know, so, so Lake Constance is basically Rhine water on both sides. And anyway, so he, he, he's walking near the Rhine and suddenly he remembers, and this is used to describe some scientist's work about talking about how our, our body's water, which is a very important part of our, our physical being, um, very much relate to the water where they were born and grew up. You know, our water comes from that. Anyway, and, and, and so this example was being used as why it's perfectly logical that somebody, upon being in the presence of the water where they grew up, would be suddenly remember and be revived. And I'm listening to this story, and suddenly I realized all the places that I go in Europe are on the Rhine, mm -hmm. including... The Rhine, when it flows into the Netherlands, one of the distributaries is the Isel River, which flows into the Isomere. So a twelfth of the water in the Isomere is Rhine water. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. All the places I hang out in Europe are connected to the Rhine, like Constance, Basel, everything. Even Zurich, the water flows into the Rhine from, from the lake and the river there. So, so I decided, okay, well, I'm going to learn more about the Rhine. And that's one of the reasons I was fascinated about, by the Rhine in the Erlinda book. So I buy a book on the Rhine, I read it, I write a review, and I'm telling everybody on the Soleri report that, um, uh, you know, I have this interest. And a guy who I've worked with for the longest, the, the person on the team I've worked with for the longest period of time, said, I guess I never told you this, I was born in a hospital on the Rhine. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things the scientist says is you have a, you resonate more with people who share the same water as where mm -hmm. you were born. Uh -huh. So I can't explain any of that, but this has caused me to be very interested in what is it about the Rhine. Did you know Rhine means uh, pure? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't in know German how I and Dutch that one. still means pure. That's probably the original meaning as well. Yeah. Rain or, yeah. Well, if you just travel the Rhine, you know, the Rhine, I thought the Rhine was a much bigger river than it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Danube is much bigger than the Rhine. But if you look at the productivity, the economic productivity around the Rhine, it's unbelievable. You know, so there's, there's definitely something there. I don't, I don't understand it yet. I'm going to keep trying to learn. Anyway, but that was part... Uh, I just laughed when I saw the Rhine in the Erlinda book. So um, I want to go back to your journey, but before I do, tell us what else in here you would like to bring out in this discussion, the things that most speak to you. Um, it really makes a lot of sense, many of the laws, and maybe not at first read, but um, I have had so many aha moments about language and about uh, origin of, um, of certain things in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, the ways well, how they talk about, uh, about freedom and about... Um, um, and some of the laws would really uh, sound strange in this time, but for example, now many things come back in other religions that we know, right. like in Christianity, which is recognizable. Uh, there's one law about usury, 
that was strictly forbidden. Right. And uh, in the context, in the whole, it also makes sense. It is, uh, it's explained. So the history of the man is once usury is adopted, it is a fait accompli that that civilization will fail. It's a question of how long it will mm -hmm. take. Yeah. Right. Same with the corruption of morals and of uh, uh, accepting slavery and uh, slave, slave mentality as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, I've driven deeper into it because nobody else did really now and I thought I saw the significance and at that time I was looking for a, a goal to work on mm -hmm. and this was just uh, there were so many coincidences also that, that it made sense to uh, to study this further and to make it more well known. So I think the Erlinda book is very relevant whether it's authentic or not um, and the reason is one you know, we're going through a period where the law is collapsing and failing, mm. the rule of law. And the question is, okay, how can I create, you know, back to Sheldrake, how can I create a field where I can share a covenant with people as to the law and it being a law which can preserve our freedom? And, you know, so we're back at the stage where we have to, we may have to reinvent everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm very interested in looking back in history and saying, okay, what has worked? And to me, you know, there's a reason I'm in Stavorn, and that is if you drive to the Red Cliffs, which is not far from here, you see it up on the Red Cliff, you know, better de dead than slave. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm always saying to people. Death is not the worst thing that can happen. No, absolutely not. I now know the answer to your earlier question, the relevance to understand what things went wrong and how we, we came where we are now um, makes it easier to, to prevent something like this or, or to partly reverse it. Right. So uh, before I knew this book, I was already thinking a lot about, uh, about religion. I was not raised uh, religiously, but later uh, I became to appreciate parts of it. Right. Um, and I was interested in the origin and being a genealogist, I, I always look for ancestors of not only of people, but also of ideas. Right. Um, and with this, it just resonated so strongly, both the language and the ideas, uh, that I thought it would probably have the same effect on, on more people. Now, do you think Zoroastrianism had an effect on the Frisians and their their culture? I have not studied Zoroastrianism myself, but there are a few obvious uh, similarities uh, between that and this culture, like the, um, the fire that they kept burning, that mm -hmm. was sacred. Um, so the eternal flame. Yeah. And some people who, who uh, have studied Zoroastrianism, one of the proofreaders did, he uh, recognized much in it, in the, the texts from uh, from that uh, religion. There's also the, the name Freya, which comes So back. they have the Divine Mother as well. I don't know if it, then, if it there also refi refers to Divine Mother, mm -hmm. but um, I'm not the right person to answer that. But the theory that um, Friso came back here, he, was, uh, mm -hmm. he brought back a lot of people after uh, the time of Alexander the Great. Um, now, isn't he the one who built this, the monastery in Stavorin? According to uh, the older uh, historiography yeah. of Friesland, which is also not taken seriously by uh, The monastery by is not taken seriously? No, the, those stories. Ah, okay. Everything from before the 1500s, 1400s uh, <laughs> is considered pure fantasy. It was really funny academia. when I was in, um, in Sofia, we went to the museum and they have a huge amount of relics of the Tartar people. Before I went, I just looked them up on Wikipedia and they said they were disgusting, primitive person, you know, people and, you know, they were defeated and terrible and, you know, and then you go look at their relics and these are beautiful, magnificent, delicate, sophisticated, and you realize, you know, these were amazing people, mm -hmm. right? But... 
Yes, it's always very good to look at uh, those things from a culture. Yeah, yeah. Those but, tell, but, sometimes tell a very different things than the than the historiography. Right. So the winner the winner tells a different tale yeah. than the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so let's come back to you and your personal journey. So you started the foundation. You published this book. Now you've published the paperback. This book sold out quickly. You underestimated the demand. <laughs> yeah. Um, this book is now selling. What has the response, what has happened to you as, uh, as a result of now presenting this and, and getting this disseminated into the world? Um, well, there's some weight from my back. I had the translation ready in 2018 already, and I thought there would be a, a publishing house uh, contacting me if they could publish it, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And that's why I um, started the foundation to yeah. do it myself. Now, you've got the whole book in here. Yeah. The, all it's the, amazing. This is the first edition with uh, color copies of the whole manuscript, all pages. Now, these are all up at the Frisian Institute in yeah. the library. Right. So I've added line numbers. And then the transliteration and the translation, they alternate. So you can easily always compare the translation to the transliteration. I've added chapter titles. I've added an alternative reading order because the manuscript order is not always chronological. Right. And I added a list of um, proper names of persons and cities and places. Um, there's a uh, foreword by Asha Logos, who made... So I was going to ask you that next. So I'll just jump to that. Okay. So um, we all, a group of us, share a love for an American, a mysterious American who makes wonderful videos. And he made three on the Errol Linda book based on your work. And he wrote the foreword. Yeah. And... Um, so if you if you don't want to read the book, I think it's uh, his name is or his his handle on the internet is Asha Logos, mm -hmm. and if you go to Asha Logos's YouTube channel, you can find three videos on the Erlinda book, which are fascinating, beautifully done. Um, and you two are in cahoots, and he wrote the foreword. So tell us a little bit about your your. Uh, alliance with Asha Logos and, and, and what he finds of value. Uh, he contacted me uh, before he started making videos uh, with the idea to make an audio book of the new translation mm -hmm. after he had heard an other interview I had done. Mm -hmm. um, then that didn't happen and we um, later we got in touch again and he was already making great videos. Right. Uh, these three videos, one hour each, are part of a larger series of subverted history. Right. Um, and because those videos were so uh, well made, uh, I asked him to write a foreword. Uh-huh, he I, did, I, I, he wrote I, a beautiful foreword. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it myself uh, like that. Uh, writing something like that is different from translating. Uh-huh. Perhaps he may do the audio book after all. Oh, really? At some point, I don't know. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. He has that a great voice. Uh, for okay. It. Well, there are many um, indications that there was a, a group of people who left traces all over the world. Mm -hmm. And official um, historiography doesn't really um, consider them as, as one. Or Does that tie back to what the the land that was destroyed really is? Um, Atlant or Atlantis. Uh, yeah. So that's the question, is Atlant Atlantis? Well, this, these texts suggest they have a timeline that started with the destruction of Atlant, the old land. Right. Um, and there's obviously um, a connection between the word Atlantis and this Atlant or Atlant. Mm -hmm. But... Um, because it means old land, it can also have meant the old world right. before the cataclysm. Right. Some people may have referred to a particular island or a coastline, right. but um, it could also just have been the old land that had been lost. And this term have, may have been used uh, more than just once. Every time that a, that a piece of right. land was lost, they could have referred to it as old right. land. And there's a history in, in those years of many, you know, of the sea 
you know, yeah. there's been a war between the sea and the people as to who gets the land, you know, during this period. Yes, there's an, uh, another cataclysm also described. So, so, so now the foundation, the two books are up. Who is reading this? Who, how is it spreading? Apparently word of mouth, mostly, uh -huh. because I only recently started a, a real web shop. Mm -hmm. Before that, I had an improvised website. And before this was printed, I had already sold most of it, half of it, right. including the mail, the shipping costs. Um, yeah, and some people order or 10 or more books and they yeah. give them to friends. Yeah. Uh, there's even a, a library in Alaska that yeah. ordered the last one, the very last Fabulous. one. Fabulous, yeah. yeah. Um, only a quarter of them stayed in the Netherlands and um, most went to America, but also New Zealand, Canada, Australia. Uh -huh. And I th probably, or uh, obviously, the, the video series of Asha Logos Has helped. did a lot for it to make it more well known. The earlier interviews I did with Red Eyes. Right. And... Um, yeah, I have had a blog since 2011, where I posted word studies or texts that were relevant to this. So tell us your URL. How do we find the URL? Most simple is uaralinda.nl. Okay. So just without a space, uaralinda.nl. That's the, where the web shop is, but there's also links to the web blog and to the video channel on YouTube. Okay. And so next year, a Dutch copy? I hope so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's also uh, an ebook for those who. Uh, the shipping time is usually uh, about two weeks or, or a month, sometimes longer. And uh, of course, obviously, the shipping is also expensive too. Uh, so you send it out in PDF or? The ebook, either PDF or EPUB. Okay. People can choose. Okay. Okay. So. And this the Dutch is... translation, yeah, I have to start doing that. Uh huh. A uh, German translation, a new one would be nice because there is one, but it's difficult to, to compare with the original language, uh -huh. which is one of my main uh, goals to make that more accessible. Okay. Well, you know, it's the never ending story. There's always another request. Yes. And the foundation also has, has one of the, uh, has uh, the goal to promote uh, not only new translations and the publications of them, but also new research. So if there would at some point be enough money to uh, to uh, do a specific investigation uh, of something. So the Frisian Institute is researching the law, the, old the law history books. of the old law yeah. and the law books. Yes. Is there other research happening that, that I'm not aware of? Uh, they do um, a lot of research, but not on the Ura Linde book as far as I know. Right, right. And if, if someone would at least uh, write a, a modern, uh, and with the new insights, with everything we have learned from archaeology in the last uh, uh -huh. decades, uh, explaining why it cannot possibly be authentic, I would really welcome that. Mm -hmm. So I can try to debunk that or uh, give another opinion about it. But that doesn't exist. The most uh, scholarly work that exists about Ural in the book was published in 2004. It was a doctoral thesis on a theological faculty in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And it's a big book, uh, someone who did a lot of work, uh -huh. uh, Goffe Jensma. But it started from the assumption that it has to be a 19th century forgery. forgery. Right. And from that uh, assumption, he uh, theorized about who could have made it and why. So it really doesn't do the serious look. I think you should first establish why it cannot be authentic. Right. Uh, in this article, uh, at the end of this, I have argued why, uh, in my opinion, it is not plausible. It's also on my web blog. Um, but it, it makes no sense theorizing about that if it's still possible that it's authentic. So when I first met you, you were on the fence. And now when I, whenever I speak to you, you're much more confident that, that it's either authentic or it's a high percentage chance it's authentic. So tell us why you have grown in your confidence that it's authentic. I think I was already very confident myself, but my, uh, my public... Um, uh, also in the first book, I have not explicitly 
taken position in the authenticity debate. So probably when I did this presentation for your group that I uh, uh, didn't want to be a, a missionary like you have to believe that this is right. true. Right. I keep it in the middle and also I very well, um, um, I can very well imagine that when you read this for the first time, it's so different from what you would expect if you know the official history, that many people will reject it simply because it's easier to reject it. It's when you consider the possibility that it's authentic, it triggers so many thoughts like, oh, this is different, this is then also different. And uh, especially if you are invested uh, emotionally in, in history, mm -hmm. you have to rethink your whole, uh, um, your whole view of, uh, of the past. Um, so I, personally, I'm, I'm convinced that it's authentic, although I do have some questions, uh, mainly about uh, the dating of the letters of instruction. Right. And uh, recently I've also started thinking about the first millennium again, which was probably only 300 years. It's a whole different uh, topic. Right. But I'm, I'm, I will always be open to good arguments against uh, authenticity. Right. And uh, you can read the translation, especially... Uh, no, you, you can read the translation as if it is um, fiction. I'm not on a mission to convince everyone that it's authentic. I want to let, this, I want to let the text uh, speak, speak for themselves. Right. So I would say, sitting here, it's December 2021. Mm -hmm. And I've spent the last two and a half years off and on learning about the Erlinda book and looking forward to 2022. The number one issue before us, facing every one of us, is will we be free or will we be slaves? Mm -hmm. So I find the Erlinda book to be phenomenally relevant to our situation. Yeah. And the, you know, part of the question of are we going to be free or slave is how to be how do we be worthy of being free? How do we achieve freedom and how do we preserve it and how do we nurture it? Mm -hmm. Because this is just bigger than pushing back the latest push to tyranny. You know, if we're going to push back tyranny for good, then the question is, okay, how are we going to build a civilization that believes in freedom, practices freedom, and doesn't permit slavery? Because we've been, my whole life, we've been permitting slavery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's time, as, as we would call it in Salaria World, it's time to push the red button. <laughs> anyway, so to me, this is uh, addressing the most important question of our day. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing about freedom, uh, I have translated it different from the earlier translations, one part where it says, where Freya says in her primal laws, only those can I accept as really free who is neither the slave of someone else nor of his own addictions. Right. The, the other translation said of his own passions, but I thought passionate, being passionate is not negative, perhaps. Right. Except when you're a slave of it. But right. uh, the Dutch word for addiction is enslavement. Really? For slaving. Right. So you are a slave of, of something and that already makes you not free. Right. So anyone who wants to be free uh, must always think, do I have addictions uh, that I am a slave of? Right. And if I free myself of that, uh, then I'm already uh, closer to being really free. Yeah. Well, Jan Ott, I can't thank you enough for bringing this into our lives and our world. Um, before we close, is there anything you would like to add? Um, anyone can start uh, by looking at uh, the video by Asha Logos, for example, if you like audiovisual presentation. Mm -hmm. Or from my uh, website that I gave, there are links to, um, to both editions. This one is sold out. I may do another one that is as pretty as this one. But this one yeah, is... Yeah, I have uh, to say it's for... Yeah. <laughs> this one is not only cheaper to make, but also... Right. It's expensive. I have a volume discount. Uh -huh. People want to order more of them. Okay. It's also less work for me, so I make a parcel and uh, yeah. a box and I send it. Uh, the ebook is uh, easy to get, of course. Uh -huh. And I 
until now it has been relatively quiet. People have complimented me for uh, what it looks like, but on the content there has not been much feedback yet. And I very much look forward to that, to, to having discussions with people who Well, it's a major the... change in thinking. Yeah. You know, it takes people a while to kind of contemplate it and digest it. You know, I'm still getting my mind around it. Mm. It's a very mind-stretching experience yeah. reading the book. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. You too. <laughs> or oh, Jule. <laughs> Jule. Got it? Got it. Okay. <clears throat> How long were we? Oh, it's not too bad. So no. we went an hour. That's a, that's hour a miracle. Yeah. Any additions? I don't think so. so. The reason why I said Yule is because the Yule is the yeah. real, huh? Yeah. That's, uh, ah. It's called the Yule of Yule. Yeah. Although I'll tell you, I think yes. one of my favorite interviews I ever did was. Um, we, we did an interview called The Culinary History of Christmas, mm -hmm. and I didn't trust the person I was interviewing to, to be prepared, so I bought and read three books on the culinary history of, of Christmas. And what I discovered is that 95% of the greatest foods in the world for Christmas all come from Germany. Mm -hmm. That is the Germans' greatest claim to fame is yeah. Christmas dinner. So. So, so, for some reason, the Frisians just didn't do it for Christmas. <laughs> well, the Germans descend from these Frisians. Eh? Yeah. The Saxons uh, yeah. were close. At some point, many Frisians went to the Saxons because they, at some point, the Saxons so were So, I want to know, I didn't want to ask you this on camera, how did the Frisians get whooped? Get? Whooped. Yeah, the rest is kicked. Yeah. Um, well, part of it was just um, military power. Because the Dutch were supported from the whole German Empire, mm -hmm. the Holy Roman Empire. Um, yeah, and probably also from the inside, things that are already described here too, that people became corrupted uh, and bought or maybe seduced. It wouldn't surprise me if it was military technology. The Germans mm -hmm. were better at military technology. And there were just many more. Yeah. The Counts of Holland, uh, the Graven of Holland, they had the whole uh, German Empire behind them. So first, but even the West Frisian Wars, West Friesland is like a smaller area. It took them a hundred years to to um, conquer them. Yeah. And then later Friesland. Uh, and many of the Frisians, they just escaped to the Scandinavian coastline and to um, England and to the right. Baltic Sea. So many. Uh, Where did they go? Left. When did they go to England? Where did they go? I, I suppose everywhere along the coast. Right. And same in the Baltic. So when it became, when the threat became too big, um, simply many will have left with their ships and goods. Before you go, the um, the Eula, the wheel, mm -hmm. the relation to Eula and celebration. Yeah. What is the, uh, the well? Link? The Scandinavian words for wheel are still U, uh -huh. only spelled differently. H J U L. U -L. And uh, well, it's the wheel of time in Uralinda. It's also described. They say um, it's a cycle of every spoke is a thousand years. So a cycle in this. Uh, Regard would be 6,000 years, a whole cycle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they also have the metaphors of the, the crowder, the carrier, the wheelbarrow. And that's interesting actually because the, the great bear, the star sign, the great bear, mm -hmm. it looks like a wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. So it will not have been the animal bear, but the, the bar, the bear, bear is an old word for uh, carrier. For uh, are you still recording? Can I take it off? No, no, no. Still recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you easy. should know and he's still recording. Yeah. Did I uh, lose it? Here it is. Okay. This is the best part. So th that is one example. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's one of the many etymologies that make more sense from this uh, perspective than the. Mm -hmm. Official. 
also logos, important word, also a word in the Christian tradition as well. Mm -hmm. um, in Old Friesian, it may, means flame. And lux in Latin uh, is light. Right. So both the word logos and the word lux would derive from this loga. Loga. It's Old Friesian word loga. Mm -hmm. In Greek, it, be, it got, later got the meaning of a word and of um, something sacred. And in Latin, it simply uh, remained the meaning of light or flame. But there's so many uh, of those little interesting uh, right. facts. And we get to those in the language series. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, indeed. <laughs>